Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, the New King James Version says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Praise the Lord. Now, a lot of, of course, it was written also to, to actually to Jerusalem and the nation, but I believe this same message is being transferred to the church, to those that love God and are serving him. So God wants to put his Lord, glory on you. So many people don't realize, though, today that they can be glorious. They don't. They don't realize that. They, they think, oh, this is something that's just reserved for God. But God wants us to realize that we can be glorious. That verse tells it there. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So he's not trying to hold it all up for himself. He wants you to walk and experience that same glory that, that uh, is in heaven today. In fact, that's what Jesus prayed. He says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a prayer that we should be praying. Amen. So God wants us to experience it. But most people don't realize they can be glorious because the devil fights so that he can keep people in the dark. He always is reminding them of Romans. He even uses scripture to do it, just as he did to Jesus in the, gar in the, the garden or in the wilderness. This, he's always reminding people of the scripture like in Romans chapter 3, verse 24. And it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, you know, that is really true. But once we become born again, we no longer have any shortcomings. So that only applies to those that don't know God. And that's the reason Jesus came. He came to the earth to die on the cross. And John chapter 17, verse 22, records Jesus' prayer to the Father. And he said this, And the glory which thou givest me, gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So that tells me that in order for us to be one, to be unified, we're going to have to experience the glory. Amen. We're going to have to be saturated in his presence, in his, in his uh, presence, in his tangible presence, so strongly that it'll, it'll unite us together. It'll be the glue that brings us all together and keeps us together. And I think it's so important that this message is shared now because there are so many congregations here today. Last night, I believe, I, I, we, I don't know if anyone counted it, but I would guess this, there was over 30 different churches that were represented in this house. That may be a conservative number, not counting those, of course, that were watching on the web. But God has a message to the church. And, he, he, and this is the prayer of Jesus. He says, the glory which you gave me, I want to, I have, I have given them. Hallelujah. Are y'all ready for the glory? Are y'all like ready to experience it? You know, you got to pray it for it. you got to expect it. Just like when you asked Jesus to come into your life when you were born again, you had to ask and you had to seek it, right? God says he's a revealer of those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He wants to reveal himself to them. And glory is defined in Nelson's Illustrated Dictionary this way. It says, beauty, power, or honor, a quality of God's character that emphasizes his greatness and authority. And they have a whole much more there, but I'm not going to read. But the glory is really God's character and his presence. And I talked a little bit about that last year in the conference. But I like the last part of it. It says, since the close of the Testament, the glory of God has been shown mainly in Christ and in the members of his church. Christ now shares his divine glory with his followers, according to John 17, 22, which I just read to you, so that their lives, in their lives, Christians are being transformed into the glorious image of God. Now I'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter th 3. I'm just laying a foundation for us this morning. Because God has, it's a process, this growth. Once we're born again, we are partaker of the glory of God, but there's a growth process that has to happen so that we can learn to be sensitive to it and move with it. Amen? I know there are moments in my life, I mean, it's, it, uh, uh, that I, I can point, look back and think I was surely in the presence of God. I mean, it was like a tangible thing that came in the room. Sometimes I was alone by myself in prayer. Some, many times it's been in services and, and meetings that we've been in that, that God, it was so heavy in there. Even in altar services where, 
You, you couldn't even hardly walk to the front and you would just fall because the presence of God settled in. I'm telling you, it's a real thing. The glory is a real thing and it's available for us. Hallelujah. I love it. Second Corinthians chapter three, are you there? In the Amplified, it says this, and it says, And all of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the Word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into His very own image in ever-increasing splendor from, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So growth process, this is a growth process. It's ever increasing. We're going to grow from one glory to another glory, not from one mess to another mess. You can't just keep, Lord, get me out of this mess. You know, uh, Lisa delivered a masterpiece last night about how we can get out of some messes that we've been in in the past. So when we learn to get victory over one mess and get in from mess going from mess to glory, then we can go from glory to glory. Amen. There's going to have to be a time when you... You pull, pull yourself up and use the Word of God and get victory over things. And, no, and every victory, no matter how small, is a, is, a, is a stepping stone toward the next victory. So God has a, a marvelous pathway of victory for you planned for your life. But you have to take a step. Amen? You got to get after it. You got to let it go, girls. And go forward. Amen? So the first point I want you to... Uh, to speak on right now, I want to say, be glory conscious. Be glory conscious. Say that with me. Be glory conscious. That's the first step, I think, towards being glorious and having a life that's filled with the glory of God or flowing in that glory. Be glory conscious. You know, there was a phrase years ago that all talked about being people were sin conscious, you know, uh, or maybe they were, instead of being sin conscious, the church needed to be more righteousness conscious. And so I believe we need to be God conscious. And, but the sad thing is so many of us are semi-conscious <laughs> or unconscious. <laughs> but God wants us to be glory conscious, okay? Glory conscious, that, that is, that's a whole nother realm. You know, all of us have five senses. That's the way God created us. You know, we have the sense of, of hearing and seeing and tasting and smelling and touching, right? Five senses. But there's like another sense out there. There's a, there's a spirit realm that we need to learn to refine sharper than we do. The, and when you learn to spend time in God's presence, when you're dedicated to studying His Word and spending time with Him in prayer and obeying what you hear, that's a key point, uh, then, then the, the, the spiritual sense gets sharp. It gets sharper and you'll be able to hear and know what God wants you to do at any moment. And you're led by His Spirit and, and you're walking in a whole other realm. It's another sense. We have to work on uh, being glory conscious and, and develop our spiritual senses so that we can recognize when God's presence is there. Adam and Eve recognized the presence of God in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says that they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And then it says, but then because they had sinned, it says that they hid themselves from the presence of God. And then Cain in Genesis chapter 4 went out from the presence of God, the word tells us. Then later, let's turn to Genesis chapter 28. I want you to read some here for yourself. There was a man named Jacob who encountered God in a visible, tangible undeniable way he saw the presence of God and he had a dream and he uh, had been traveling and in verse 12 in Genesis chapter 28 it says and as he slept he dreamed of a stairway that reached up from earth to heaven now I'm reading from the NLT and he says and he saw the angels of God going up and down on it Verse 13, and at the top of the stairway stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham and of the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will cover the land from the east to the west, from the north to the south. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. See, God still had his promise to Abraham on his mind. God is still looking for somebody that would walk in the steps they needed to walk in, that would receive his message and go forth so that he can fulfill his good promise to Abraham. 
like I read earlier. In verse 15, he says, What's more, I will be with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. I will someday bring you safely back to this land. I will be with you constantly until I have finished giving you everything I promised. I tell you, God is watching over his word. He has thrown his word out there, and Jesus said, my word will not return void. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. God's word created the world that we see. The Bible says that though he framed it by the words of his mouth. And so his word is a powerful thing. And so he wanted to get his word into, I love this part where he says, I will be with you constantly until I have finished giving you everything I have promised. God has his promise on his mind. His promise to you is still on his mind. His promise to all of us. Glory to God. And then verse 16, and Jacob woke up and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. When he laid down that night and he, he had a rock for a pillow or something like that, he, he had no idea that he had come to a place, a strategic place that God was going to visit him at. You may not know that when you walk through the door today that you came to a place, to a moment in time, to a moment in your life that your life is never going to be the same again, that you've encountered the presence of God in this place. You may not feel it in your spiritual senses because you haven't maybe experienced it or grown to, the, to understand it, but it began. And God is already doing a great work. Hallelujah. So God has, he says, I wasn't even aware of it. And he, verse 17 said, and he was afraid and said, what an awesome place is this? It is none other than the house of God, the gateway to heaven. You know, that was a physical place on the earth that day that, that Jacob encountered. But today we have access to heaven because of Jesus at any moment and any time. We don't even have to be in this building. Any place the Bible tells us where two or more are gathered in his name, he is in our midst. Surely at that moment when we agree in faith, we are at the gateway to heaven right there. God is not restricted now like the like way he chose to operate in the Old Testament. But today we have access to all of heaven. Amen? So Jacob encountered the tangible, visible, undeniable presence of God. I love that. He says, what an awesome place is this. He reverenced it. And he actually came back later and I think built some monument there. But... And that's what we need to do. We need to be glory conscious. He, he's remembered, that's the spot. That's the place I was back on. He knew the time, whether it was the year, uh, what may have been, like 300. I don't know. I didn't research that. But there was a, that was a moment in time that he knew that he was there at that place. And his life was forever changed. And each one of us have those moments in our lives that we're forever changed. Amen? I was forever changed when I got born again in May of 1973. And each one of us ought to be able to look back and say that I was born again at that time. And we prayed, that many of you that were here last night, we all prayed together the prayer of salvation. Some of you may have prayed that for the very first time. So you can mark down October the 16th, 2009, as your day that you encountered heaven. Maybe for the very first time. Amen? Let's give the Lord a hand clap for that. There are many people in the Bible, I'm just going to read a few of them really quickly, by, that recognized, that encountered, that understood the presence of God. Some acted favorably, some did not. Did not. Jonah, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 10 says, And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. So Jonah experienced the presence of God. God spoke to him audibly. God spoke to him and gave him an assignment and he walked away from it. He knew what the presence of God was. He knew about the glory. And then, of course, Moses, the most well-known one in Exodus chapter 33, he said, he was talking to God and he said, if, he said, if my, and God said in verse 14, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So Moses said, if you, I love this presence. I have to have it. I have to have the presence of God. You know, so many of us don't know what we need. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'll sometimes, I don't know what I need. 
I'll go up to the refrigerator, I'll open it, I'll look. I know what I, I, know what I want, but I don't really know what I need. Anyway, I'll go to the pantry trying to figure out something to eat. I mean, we just sometimes, we're just at a loss. We don't know what we want. We don't really know what we really need. But uh, we need the presence of God. We need the presence of God more than anything else. And Moses recognized that. And he says, if, if, because they were, God was following them. He's, they all saw him on the mountain. And he says, if you don't go with us, I'm not leaving this spot. And so he also sought him. He said, Lord, God, show me your glory. And God answered him and he says, I'm going to show you my glory. He says, I'm going to reveal to you my goodness. So really, God's glory is his character, like I defined when I read the definition from Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary. God's glory is his character. So when we are uh, changed in his presence, we become more like him. We are changed from glory to glory. We're going from one level to another level. Amen? And I believe we're moving up to our higher place in God. How many moving up? Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. So Moses experienced the power, the presence of God. As, and then, you know, he was in the tent of meeting and Joshua. The, the whole nation saw the glory of God. They saw that pre tangible presence of God. They experienced it. And I believe God is calling us to reach out for more of his presence day by day in our own lives. In Acts chapter 3, this says this, verse 19. The NLT again, it says in verse 19, Now turn from your sins and turn to God so that you can be cleansed of your sins. Then wonderful times of refreshment will come from the presence of God, of the Lord. And he will send Jesus, your, your Messiah, to you again. So God is calling us to turn to him to get into his presence so that we can get refreshed. Sometimes we seek other things to help us to get all refreshed, but God's presence is what refreshes us, strengthens us, and brings us to the place that God wants us to be. So the reality of God's presence must be appreciated and communicated or it can be lost. Isn't that true? So uh, what we need to do is always be glory conscious. Say, I'm going to be glory conscious. I'm going to be glory conscious. Praise the Lord. You know, and the glory is not just a feeling. It's, it's the, God's presence can be there. You may not feel it, but you know it. You know it in that sense that I talked about. That presence is there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So let's turn to... Um, where am I going? First, sec, Second Corinthians chapter 5. Be glory conscious. Be glory conscious. Be glory conscious. Like, like Jacob said, I, surely God was in this place and I didn't even know it. You may not even know it, but God is in this place. He is here changing and transforming us and pulling us up to a higher place. So the way that we have to know it is that we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Be renewed in the spirit of our mind. You know, I, I realized uh, the other day that many of us are under construction. You know, and there's almost like this. Have you ever been at a construction site? We're building a house and it's a major construction site and there's things you have to be, there's lots going on, lots of things are happening. And there's a, it's a progress, building something, whether it's a life or a business or a family, or a home, or a church, or a ministry. It's a process, right? A few years, uh, a while back, I love, right now I love, because I guess the project, building project, I love DIY channel. I watch the uh, home and garden channel a lot. Anytime there's any kind of kitchen renovation or a bathroom renovation show on, I'm watching it. You know, on, I like direct TV and I'm always watching channel 229 or 230. Because, I mean, I just like watching all they'll, And one time, I think they were demolishing a house. It's amazing to see they came in and they, they had a major renovation they were doing. And this huge, huge piece of equipment came in and just started tearing up stuff and, and pulling things away. Now, the owners had decided that they wanted to do this total renovation of their house. And they were doing major, major construction. And I could see the owner's face when that first started happening. They weren't sure. They were starting to think, did I really make the right decision here? Because, I mean, your whole house starts coming apart and, and they're pulling the roof off on one part of the house and then they're going to throw a wall out. Anybody ever been under construction while you're still living in the house? 
So, I mean, the camera would flash images of their face and they would look terrified. Is this guy, does this guy really know what he's doing? Is my whole house gonna just crumble up? You know? <laughs> And so they started freaking out, but they, they started looking over the plans, making sure that they had it all right and that everything was going to be fine. So because the show was just a one hour project, it's not like me, what I'm dealing with a year or two year project I'm dealing with. So in one year, one hour, I could see the whole thing start to finish. So it really was good. They sped it up and they could see them, you know, pouring the slab, doing everything, painting the walls, everything was done. And pretty soon everything looked pretty good. But there was a moment where everything was in demolition mode. So they were in a demolition mode and then they went on from the demolition uh, zone basically to a construction zone. So sometimes, like Lisa was saying last night, you need to tear some things down. You need to yank some things out. You need to pull things up, not just surface. Sometimes the entire slab had to come out, you know, because the, all of a sudden that foundation was wrong. Something was cracked in the foundation. Oh, and they, they dug into one spot and they said, oh, we have termite. They, until you start digging into something, you don't really realize what's there. But I found out that when you give God the opportunity and you're open before him, he will reveal the real thing, the real issue that you have to deal with. And, and I know that when I've had encounters with people, maybe bad uh, confrontations or problems, things that they say, most of the time is not the thing that's really bothering them. There's something else way under the surface that they maybe were a surface that they were offended by and it just manifests in this other way. So all of us, have encountered things like that in our lives. And so, when, when you, just like that house project, when they were demol demolishing that house, not all of it, but part of it, you could see that there, there, was, there was distress, there was concern, there was pressure coming on to the homeowners. But they had to stick with the vision and realize that the contractor knew what he was doing. They had a good plan. They they'd had a plan first, and they're following through with the plan. And, and when they encountered something new that, that was unexpected, they had to go back to the plan and make sure that they were on the right track. And see, so God is, is telling us this morning that he has many of us, in fact, all of us are under construction. In fact, there's like a sign pasted on our head, caution, mine under construction. So what we do, I mean, some, most of us have a bigger one than, than uh, others, but. Hopefully we all have that. Because what the word tells us that we have to be constantly being renewed in the spirit of our mind. Because the battles that we go through, more than anything, most of the time they're in our mind. They start there. Even if we have a physical issue, the battles that we're encountering day by day can be overcome if we just start believing what the Word of God says and start changing our mind instead of believing the report of the devil or a bad report, we believe what God's Word has said. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So we're moving out of demolition zone and into the construction zone. Amen? So but before we made the decision to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were all a lot like that house that was under re reconstruction. There was nothing about us that was worth keeping. We had to be totally cleaned away inside before Jesus could come into our life. There was nothing that we could do to fix it by ourselves, right? So we have to realize that there's nothing that we can do personally to fix the mess we may be in now. So in order to go from mess to glory, we have to let God fix the mess. We have to help him to sh allow him to show us what we need to do to get things right, right? So let it go, girls. <laughs> let it go. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man, which means mankind, be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and all things, it says, behold, all things become new. So in an instant, when we became born again, God demolished our old house and our dead lives, and it was replaced with a new recreated spirit. A new recreated spirit that could walk in the glory of God, that could experience the presence of God, that could flow with God and see situations change. I don't know about you, but that excites me. I am so turned on about following God and watching Him move and change lives. I love it, I love it. Let's give Him another hand clap. I just.
I like the way the Amplified says that same verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, a new creation, a, a, a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old, previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. You don't have to do things the old way. You don't have to struggle in your own strength or rely upon your own talents or if you, even if you have talents. You don't have to rely on your, your heritage, your family, your background, your religion, or any other background. You rely on Jesus. Amen. He is well able to do it. Well able to do it. And God has good things planned for you because you are his masterpiece. You are created in his image, and he wants you to flourish. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to be glorious. He truly does. He loves it when his children stand up and take their place. Don't you love that as parents when your children stand up and take their place and they, and they walk forward and they're, they're strong and they just get after it? Amen? They get it on. So God has good things planned for us. And uh, even though every tool that you already need has been provided by your master builder, you will need to go through an intense training period. I know it. And since you've already technically in a construction zone, right? Mind under construction. It would be, be wise to wear a hard hat. <laughs> and he's issued us that. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us to take on the helmet of salvation. So once we're born again, we've walked into that construction site. We, anytime you walk into a construction site, you may be handed a hard hat. You know, we don't always do it on our site. I shouldn't say that, I guess, but... You didn't. I remember we walked on a large building site here in New Orleans, and you, they handed us a hard hat. We went to pray for the, the business owner, Gene Viola, and their, the Viola Homes were building a large complex on the east side of New Orleans, and they issued us a, a hard hat. No, no, no uh, exceptions. They, weren't, they didn't ask us, would you like to wear this hat? No, if you were going to be on the property, you were wearing the hat or you were off the property. And so we have to realize that we have to, we're in a construction zone, we've got to keep our hat on. We have to keep the helmet of salvation on because that's what's going to protect our mind from, from the attacks of the enemy because he's always flinging the darts. Amen? So the, but the purpose of the helmet of salvation is much like a hard hat. It's designed to protect your mind, which is the devil's main area of attack. Of attack. And when we take, make the decision to take the helmet and keep it on, we actually take the first step toward demolishing the devil's plan to control our thought life. Amen? Amen. So we're glory conscious. Amen? We're God conscious. We're not unconscious or semi-conscious. We're conscious that God wants us to grow up. So even though we may not be perfect and things don't go right every time, just hang a sign up and say, pardon my dust. You ever saw that sign in the construction? Parted my dust. I mean, I mean there, there's sometimes when I'm walking along, I think I'm doing things right, but I create a little dust storm sometimes because I know I'm not perfect. And I know many of you are, have the same testimony because I live with you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just talking to one or two of you here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is a verse that I memorized when I was just, a, when I was first born again, I had never read the Bible. And Romans chapter 2, verse 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The New Living Translation makes it even clearer. I love it. It says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. So, you know, when I was first born again, I had never read the Bible, so my, my mind really needed an overhaul. It needed to be totally renewed. And so I spent time with what some would call in the cocoon, you know, because the Bible compares the transformation to a metamorphosis, like, much like a, cocoon, a caterpillar crawls in and makes a cocoon before it becomes a butterfly. So I spent lots of time, and I had lots of time because I was traveling with Jesse. He was a nightclub entertainer at the time. I was born again before him, and uh, I got born again watching Billy Graham on television, and Jesse was uh, playing rock music, and I was by myself in the hotel room with my daughter Jody. And at the time, I, I had never read the Bible up to that point. 
But I began reading the Bible after that. Because I, I didn't even know what had happened to me. He just he came into the hotel room and he said, he saw me crying on the edge of the bed. And I, he says, what's up with you? And I said, well, I've been watching Billy Graham. And that's all I could say because I started crying again. And he cursed and he said, don't watch Billy. <laughs> Because, you know, his mom had taught him the Word of God. He rejected it. He didn't want anything to do with it. Is he here? <laughs> but he'll, he'll be the first to tell you that he, he thought he was safe marrying me. He says, I'm going amongst the Philistines. <laughs> they uh, all wanted him to marry one of the girls in the church. And he said, I'm going amongst the Philistines. And I never thought of myself as a Delilah. And I wasn't anything like a Delilah. I wanted to be a third grade school teacher. And here I hooked up with this wild, crazy guy. <laughs> and so she thought she was sa he thought he was safe marrying me. And here he is, I get born again. And he comes in the room, so now all his little, his little kingdom started crumbling because I started reading the Gideon Bible in the hotel rooms. And I called his mom on the phone and I told her, you know, that I'd prayed the prayer and they sent me his, her, his dad's Bible. And I started studying and I got into that cocoon and I started being transformed. And the first scripture that I memorized was this, Romans chapter two. It's amazing that God leads you to the verses that you need. Because when I first started reading the book of uh, the Bible, I started reading the Bible, I opened up in the Gideon Bible in the hotel room. And of course I went to page one and because I had never, we had like little missiles, you know, and I'd hear a scripture here and there when we went to church occasionally, but we weren't even good Catholics growing up. <laughs> Catholics know what I'm talking about. And Cajun Catholics especially. So how many people here are ex-Catholics or maybe you're still a Catholic? Let me see him. Jesse and I were married in Holy Rosary Catholic Church. I remember the, the priest had to get on his case because he caught Jesse drinking the wine in the back room. <laughs> And we both stumbled in there drunk in the morning when we get married. It's a morning wedding. And I had just been, just graduated from high school. I was just 17, not even 18. And we, uh, we just were crazy. What can I say? And my mother, she hated Jesse. All those stories that Jesse tells you about the mother-in-law, they're all true. She gave him a hard, he gave her a hard time. You know, but if I'd have been my mama back then, I may have put a, took a shotgun to him <laughs> if he'd have come to my house. But they, they fought like cats and dogs. It's, it was really true. It was sad, so sad. <laughs> I remember the last words mama spoke to me as we were leaving home our little town after we had gotten married. We went to a three-day honeymoon. Jesse and I had a really glorious honeymoon. Let me tell you about it. <laughs> Uh, we actually went to the Century Motel in New Orleans for, I think it was just like two nights because he had to play in, I mean, we had no money, absolutely no money. He had maybe $300 in his pocket. I remember I was working right before we got married and, and we used little, what little money I had, some of that too, but we, we had nothing. And so we were just, just struggling. And so we, were at the, we went to the Century Motel, and I remember we'd go to Bourbon Street, cause, and there was only one place that we could go, because I was so young, I couldn't get anywhere, and he knew one or two places that would sell alcohol to me. All we could think about was drinking in those days. We were the worst heathens. Y'all didn't know that about me, huh? But Jesse and I uh, had this little tiny honeymoon, really uneventful, it was awful because I mean, I don't have really good memories of my honeymoon. I truly don't because it was so cold. He loved everything really ice cold in the room. And I was always freezing. And it didn't matter to him because he wanted to be comfortable. He's such a selfish person. <laughs> was, was. But we grew up together. I was 17, he was 20, you know, and I told him I put all those hairs on his chest. When I met him, he just had one or two, but they're covered now. <laughs> of course, they're gray. <laughs> Most of them are gray. Some are even white. <laughs> but we don't care. I think uh, at one time we were with Jerry and Carolyn Savell. I don't know if we were the, what happened, but uh, they, they saw Jesse had hair. Cause... Hello? They had... Did Jesse take my mic off? <laughs> Don't y'all listen to Jesse back there in the sound booth. 
But uh, I remember that his shirt was wet, so you could tell that he had hair behind his shirt. And, uh, and Carolyn said, oh, Jesse, you have hair on your chest. <laughs> Jerry doesn't have any hair. <laughs> she often did things like that. And how does a husband react when a wife says something like that about someone else? Jerry had an amazing comment. He says, grass doesn't grow on the playground, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so Jess and I grew up together basically we've been married 39 years now never once separated never once divorced we've thought of murder many times You know, if you love someone, you can get so aggravated at them because you want them to just do it right. You just want them to be perfect. But you know what? I've learned to choose my battles over the years. I've given up on a few battles because they don't matter. Doesn't matter if he leaves dirty clothes all over the floor. So I do it too sometimes. I've become more like him. We're both slobs. <laughs> but not all the time. Just we have our moments where we're slobs because we're busy. And we have an excuse for being a slob, and then all of a sudden we clean it all up. But uh, we've grown up together, and it, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful now. You know, we have a great relationship, and we work together. It's amazing if you work together. We're together lots of times, almost 24-7. And, and there hasn't been a murder yet, so that's pretty good. But I remember the words my mother gave uh, me, words of wisdom, she thought, as I was leaving the driveway of the house where she lived at the time, and uh, Jesse and I had just been married, went to our little quick three-day honeymoon there in New Orleans, Louisiana, because we got married in Homa, so we went to the big city of New Orleans. And uh, so here was all my little wedding gifts were in the small, tiny, probably the smallest U-Haul tra trailer they had, and pulling, it was being pulled by this bomb of a car. I think it was a Buick LeSabre that. Uh, just a, months, a few months later locked up on us because it, it, uh, it got overheated or something. We were always having issues with vehicles back then. But um, just before we got in the car, Mama's last words to me was, Honey, just remember, you can leave that trash anytime you want. <laughs> True. And so I think in the beginning I just stuck it out because I wanted to prove her wrong. I wanted to prove to her that I made the right decision. And so uh, she hates thinking about that sometimes because she thinks maybe that pushed me to put up with bad situation. But Jesse was never abusive in that way. He always provided. He just was uh, an adulterer and a heathen. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but, you know, Jesus came into my life. I had no hope before then. I was in a terrible situation. I didn't even know how to get out of it. I was under a major major uh, demolition. My whole life was in shambles. It wasn't anything about my life that really I could fix. Because I tried and I had, it was a year and a half before I got born again, I couldn't fix anything myself. I tried, I did everything I knew I could do. I was shocked with the transformation. Because you know, some guys, when they're, they act differently before they got married, then after they get married, they're totally a different person. You know, and uh, Jesse treated me, he often said, like a little China doll, he put me up here and then he'd do whatever else he wanted. And so it was really an uncomfortable place to be in. And so when I reached out to God, I really didn't even know what I was doing. I know today that I pray that God touched my life because someone else prayed. Jesse's mama had been praying for her son, and I guess she realized in order to get to her son, she had to start praying for me. She liked me. I mean, she, did, she actually told Jesse when I, he brought me home one day, that's going to be your wife. You know, because Jesse drove me up to his little, the little trailer his family lived in, in uh, Grand Bois, Louisiana, which is below Berg, for those of you who don't even know that. Now, Berg is even a smaller town near Homa. Now, people don't even know where Homa is. Homa is south of New Orleans. So they got lots of little towns. Y'all know where I'm talking about. And so here it is. He drove me there because he wanted to pick up something. He left it at the house, and he had me go in. I, he says he didn't expect his mama to say that, but I think he did. So he brought me in, and he, he says, his mama said, that's the girl you're going to marry. And he says, Mom, I'm just dating. I don't want to marry her. But he asked me to marry him right off the bat. He did. But I told him no, because we were just dating just a few months. And, 
And I said, no, I'm not ready to get married. I was still very young. And so we just kept dating. And so he didn't say anything else. And we just continued to date. And then after a while, you know, we, we dated for another year. And so I told him, <laughs> sit yourself down. No. <laughs> he, the reason he came out, because he's always telling people that I asked him to marry me. And I was getting to that point. I was getting to that point. Page two. Well, you see, what happened was when I told him no, he stopped. You know, he didn't ask me again. So I thought, you know, I kind of like that idea. And so I said, Jesse, you can ask me to marry you now. And so, and then he did. And that's the truth. But our lives had a lot, I mean, we had a lot going on in our lives. But once I met Jesus, our lives totally turned around. Not because I began praying for him. And about a year and a half later, he had an opportunity to watch Billy Graham on television. And I, I, we were in another city, Boston, I think in Boston, Massachusetts area. And I said, Jesse, why don't you watch Billy Graham with me? And uh, then he said, well, why would I want to do that? But he added a whole lot of other words with that. <laughs> And I said, well, he pulls more people than you do. <laughs> and he had a whole stadium full of people. And Jesse's rock group didn't attract nearly that amount of people. I mean, Billy Graham brought in millions with his message to the lost. And so he says, yeah, look at that. He's got a great crowd, you know. And so he stopped and he listened just before he was going to go into play. And, and he just, God started touching his heart. And, he began to cry, and he didn't want Joe. He, no one had ever seen him cry. He said he didn't cry since he was five years old, and I couldn't even imagine that because I cried at the drop of a hat. <laughs> but he couldn't. He wouldn't cry, so he didn't want Jody and I to see him crying. So he got up and he went into the bathroom, and he got born again. He, he prayed and sought God. <laughs> Amen. And I remember my little daughter was with me right then that day, and she said, "Daddy's not going to hell anymore." <laughs> Because that was my message to everybody I met, because I didn't know anything about the Bible. I just look at them and say, you know what? You may not know this, but if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. I tell that, I never, the first words to my mother after I got born again, I was going, born again about six months. And I came home to visit her, and she never knew where I was at half the time, because we were going from two weeks in every different city. She, and I wouldn't call home. I was the worst child. And I wouldn't call home. I was just, just going by the seat of my pants, living my life freelessly and uh, fearlessly, recklessly, whatever kind of way you can imagine. And, and uh, I remember when I came home, I, first words I, I told her, Mama, you're going to hell. <laughs> and you know, she was just so glad I was home. She said, that's nice, honey. <laughs> I can really relate to that. And she was so kind and loving to, to accept me and my imperfections. You know, even as brand new Christians, we all have made mistakes like that. I mean, but my heart was right and she knew it. And, uh, and, and I was just consumed with the Word of God. Everywhere I'd go, I'd look at the grocery store girl. I'd, the girl that was checking out groceries. And I, I'd, look at, I'd look at her and I'd think, she's going to hell. <laughs> that was my message, you're going to hell. So even when Jody, so her first words when her daddy went in there, uh, daddy's not going to hell anymore. <laughs> But you know, if you're not born again, or you're indifferent to the gospel, the way I was, you really, there's a whole group of people like this in the world, an amazing amount of people, that don't give a thought, one, at any moment of the day about heaven or hell. I was one of those. I wasn't really running from God. I didn't even think about God. I was indifferent. And God, I encountered God at a moment in my life because someone else prayed. Someone else started targeting me for the gospel. I don't even know why I turned the channel on. I don't even know why I kept sitting there. And you know, in that day, they didn't have Christian television. So he came on secular TV, which is why Jesse and I try to stay on as much secular television as we can. But we, we were there. We, I, we, I watched that program, uh, not even planning to do so. I don't remember what he said. I don't remember what I prayed, but I know I was changed. And that's what God does. And we have our lives that are all totally demolished. And then one, there's a moment in time, there's a, there's a moment that we reach 
and we, we encounter the living God. We encounter the presence of God. Even in that hotel room where nobody was even around, I was like Jacob that day. Surely this is where the presence of God is. See, the presence of God is everywhere in the earth today. He's just searching, looking for someone that he can show himself strong to. The eyes of the Lord, he's looking, he's searching for those that are ready and ripe. And that'll just say, Lord, I need you. You may not even know how to pray, but you cry out to him, he's there in an instant. He hears your cry. Amen? He hears it. Hallelujah. And he's, he's searching, he's looking for those people that are ready for him. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready for more of Jesus? Are you ready to experience the glory? Are you ready to be glorious? Hallelujah, hallelujah. I believe that we've stepped up into a higher place in the realm of the spirit and that God is gonna hold us responsible for what we know. And he says, in order to walk in that level of, of glory, you're gonna have to make sure that you live a clean and holy life. He's coming back for a glorious church, a church that's without spot or wrinkle. And he is the one that's able to help us get cleaned up and stay clean. Hallelujah. We can't do it ourselves, but he can do it. Amen? It's that amazing grace. So even if you're in a mess and you have to tell people, just pardon my dust. God's working on something. I'm working on something. God and I together are working on something. Did you know, he can't do it by himself. He will not do it by himself. He needs you to cooperate with the Holy Ghost. And when you cooperate with the Holy Ghost, your life will be changed. Amen? So uh, there's a verse in uh, Philippians chapter 4 that tells us one way that we can... Uh, have spiritual growth that we need and it, it has to do with how we think because like I told you earlier we have to be God conscious we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind we have to move from the demolition zone to the construction zone we have maybe even though we have dust we're growing but uh, our minds don't need to be troubled or tormented by the lies of the devil we have a choice say I have a choice Instead of thinking about defeat and failure, we can choose to elevate our thinking to, and follow God's glorious plan for our life. And uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, very familiar verse says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. So these are the things that we think on when we want to move over out of the demolition zone, out of the construction zone, and into the glory zone. We want to think on what God tells us to think on instead of focusing on bad reports, good reports. Amen? And the Word of God is chock full of it, full of great things that we can fix our minds on. In fact, that's what the Amplified says. And when it says, if there are any virtue, if there are any praise, instead of saying, think on these things, it says, fix your minds on them. So I know girls know how to fix their mind on something. <clears throat> I know that maybe when you're shopping or you see something in a magazine or you fix your mind on a certain, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain thing that you want, either for yourself, for your house, or if you're doing Christmas shopping, you know how to fix your mind on something. I know how to fix my mind on something I want to do in the house, if it's just a decorating project or something that I want to, Jesse to do. <clears throat> I know how to fix my mind on that project. And I've actually learned how to say it in a different way so that I can actually get the desired results. <laughs> we grow, we learn. Instead of pushing the wrong buttons, you learn how to push the right buttons. You learn how to, and I don't think it's actually manipulation maybe, but uh, it's just called wisdom. You learn how to talk to people. You learn how to respect people. And I mean, there was a time in our marriage, I remember we would, there was this ugly moment, I remember, and it's, it, it, I don't know how long ago it was, but you know, we were born again, serving the Lord and everything, but we got so busy with uh, doing things. And I remember we would get up in the morning, go in different directions. Everybody was, we were always busy. And we were, we were, we were kind to each other, but 
we were, uh, I remember we'd wake up in the morning and just go in different directions. And I made a point, you know, it just bothered me. I said, you know what? I'm going to make sure every morning I get up and I'll say, good morning, how did you rest? You know, make a point to stir up a nice conversation. Because it's so easy to just get up and be grumpy or just ignore each other. One go to the TV, one go to the coffee pot, or whatever the routine is. But I made a point of thinking of good things to say, or always, well, how was your day? And, and when he comes back at night late from a meeting, instead of griping and saying, don't turn the light on, I'm sleeping, <laughs> or whining, or griping, I'm telling you, and he will testify to this every single time, no matter what time of night it is, or how late it is, I'll say, well, how was the meeting? How, how, how was it? Did you have a good meeting? You know, and get, make, in fact, you have to make a point of getting interested in each other, and sharing each other's interests, amen? A few years ago, Jesse and I had, uh, he had no hobbies. My, my assignment was to get this guy a hobby. Because all he did was work, 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 all the time, travel, all he was consumed with going in, and that was good, but he needed to have, to have some downtime. Ladies, we know that's true. Everyone needs that. Even Jesus would, took himself aside and rested. And so he sat by the sea and he'll re he rested. So it's so important. And so I remember one time I said, Jesse, you really need a hobby. So I bought him uh, some golf clubs. And uh, six lessons and all the gear, the bag, you know, the, everything that went with it. And uh, he said he had to give them away because it was causing him to go to hell. <laughs> he only took three of the lessons. He threw dirt all over the instructor and he was so mad and angry every time he came back. This was not his gift. So he sewed it into someone's life. Then, another, then a little while later I decided maybe fishing is the answer. And so he, I bought him two fishing rods, the tackle, the rubber shrimp boots, you know, girls. The fishing boots or whatever it is so that you get in the slop, whatever it is, then in the South Louisiana, whatever. I don't know. I got what I thought because I had never been fishing, so I didn't know. But I bought what I thought he would need to fish. Now, I used to see these people fish along the side of the road. I even thought, man, that looks pretty relaxing. You don't have to have a boat. Let's just get him a rod. Let him go stand on the side of the road and <laughs> drop it. You know, we don't live along a lake or like a lot of people. We're just in the subdivision. So I, I don't know. We'll figure out where we'll, where we'll go fishing. But I'm going to get you a fishing rod. So I got it for him. And he, uh, I think it was Christmas. And he opened everything up. And he says, fishing rod? I don't know. I don't go fishing. He sa I said, I know, but you're going to go fishing. <laughs> he says, well, why do I need two? I said, well, one for a friend. And he's so busy, he didn't have time for friends, you know, in a distant friendship. So he says, I don't have any friends. I said, I'm your friend. We're going fishing. <laughs> We've never used it. I think they're dry rotted up there in the attic. <laughs> but then we discovered motorcycles. Yeah, we ride Harleys. I remember our first motorcycle trip, though, it wasn't on a Harley, it was on a Goldwing. That's what he, someone told him he needed to have for those tours that we were going in. We, went, we would go like miles, I forget how many miles, 1,400 miles or whatever it is, rode all around the mountains of Colorado. But the first motorcycle we got, we got from us friends in, uh, that had a motorcycle dealership in Alabama, and we went there and they outfitted us. And, and we didn't know, I mean, we, we just let them give us whatever they thought we needed. And we, we look, we, we, he gave us these white helmets, and of course the bike was a red color. And then we had, um, he gave us these rain suits, because sometimes when you're riding you need a rain gear to put on. And he gave us these all-in-one jumpsuit white things with red and blue stripes on it. And we looked like astronauts. <laughs> we were a sight. And here we are, we show up with the Copelands and the Savelles on our first motorcycle vacation. And they looked at us and they were so kind to not laugh in our face. Because let me tell you, Jerry Savelle is the most organized, classy guy. I'm telling you, even the towel on his motorcycle matches the color of his motorcycle. Helmets, everything's coordinated, everything's right. And we thought, what's wrong with us, you know? You ever been in that situation where you show up and you think you look good and you don't? <laughs> we were a mess, but we were warm. And we were safe because everybody could see us coming. <laughs> but we had fun and this was his hobby, so we, we found something that he could stick to. And I discovered that uh, needed to, we needed to do it together. 
And so we, 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 this is our hobby, and now I think I like riding it more than he does. And, and I have to, uh, I'm, I'm even telling him, if you don't start riding this thing, I'm getting my own. <laughs> no, but he has to, uh, I like, he likes to be totally rested when he rides the bike, especially if I'm on it, so we act, we're really safe. But we have a good time with it, but that's what I told him, you need to have a hobby, you need to rest. And, and so we've done that, and we've gotten to know that we, it, that's how we developed our relationship, we're together. So when we're on the bike, he has one job and I have my job. And I love my job, because I get to tell him where to go. <laughs> my job is to rightly divide the map of the USA. <laughs> I do, I take the map out, okay, Jesse, you turn here, and he has to listen. Now, a lot of our trips, we took off straight from our home in New Orleans and we met everybody up in Colorado. And uh, so we always had the longest journey to and from. So we had a lot of time by ourselves, which is really nice. And at the, you know, we'd have this helmet. And I remember one time we were riding and I told him, uh, you know, I may be way off my subject. I'm gonna have to figure out a way. I'm following my husband's example, I think. He's a bad influence, no. Where was I at? Oh, one time we had this helmet on. And I remember he was, I told him, Jesse, I want to stop. I'm tired, I have to get off this thing. But he wouldn't make a, ho we, we, he said, we don't need to make a hotel reservation. There'll be a hotel uh, when we need it. But his faith was not very strong that day because no hotels were available. And he was fussing and I just, he thought I was hearing everything he was saying, but I unplugged him. He didn't even know it. Another time we were riding, I thought the map was right. In fact, the map said exit here, there's an exit. And I went to this exit and um, I told him to go to the exit. Now we were in a rainstorm, it was raining. You couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. So we took the exit that was supposed to be there according to the map. Now of course right now he always says that uh, that was not on the map, but I will tell you it was on the map. <laughs> But we were riding on, this, on the motorcycle and here he had to come to a complete stop because there was a barricade and there was like a 30 foot drop. Ooh, right. So I failed that day on my, my uh, gift to rightly divide the map of the USA. But we have a great, uh, a lot of fun doing that. And it's important that when you, as marriages, in marriages, that you find some common interests and you support one another. So I go on the motorcycles and then he comes shopping with me. And somebody's got to carry the bag, so that's good. So what are you fixing your mind on today? You know, it says, think on these things I just read in Philippians. Whatsoever things are lovely, just, good report. Think, fix your minds on the good things that God has already said about you. Instead of fixing your mind on the, on the failures, fix your mind on the future that God has for you. He has a glorious future. And when our minds are under construction, we're all a work in progress. So let's be gracious. Let's extend mercy to people because each one of us are growing up. Amen. We all at different levels of maturity. And so we need to take time to let God uh, get into God's word and let his word transform our way of thinking. It, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm not going to read all of these, but in, the re we just, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, in the rest of the chapter just about, it talks about how we are to renew our minds. It's one, one of the first chapters in the Bible that deal with this. And in verse 22, Ephesians chapter 4 says, And that, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay, a, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which is in the likeness that God has create, been, been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And then the remainders of that chapter, there contains seven things that show us how to put on our new self and be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And since we don't have time to study that, I'm just going to read off the list and you could realize that in verse 25, it tells us to be real. In verse 26, it talks about being forgiving. In verse 27, it talks about being wise. It says, be wise. Well, it says it in a whole lot of ways, but I shorten it to those phrases. And, and then the fourth way, we have to be diligent. In verse 28. And in verse 5, be word conscious. If you study out that chapter. And then verse uh, 30, be sensitive. I'm going to read that verse. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of judgment. Be sensitive. 
In verse 7, uh, the last one, uh, seventh one in verse 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And so be loving. Let love rule your hearts and minds. And so that's the, the assignment God gave me to tell you today that God wants you to be glorious and to recognize that He wants you to be God, glory conscious. And in order to, to walk in the glory, He's going to expect you to clean up your acts. If there are things in your life that need transforming effect, there will be. We're all growing. We're all going to be going from glory to glory. We're all going to be moving from one degree of splendor to another. And so we, instead of moving from mess to mess, we're going to move from mess up to glory and then glory to glory to glory. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to be glorious. <clears throat> so God has a great plan for us, and we have, we're going to take hold of that vision to arise. Rise up from the depression, the Amplified says, from the place that you're in. Rise up. Let rise up. It's something that you do. You rise up and, and shine. Now, even when things look difficult, rise up and shine with the glory of the Lord. Why? Because it has been, it's already been risen upon you. His glory has already been placed on you, and it's our assignment to rise up and be glorious. Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your heads and would the musicians please come to the platform? We're just going to pray for a moment here before we change, uh, dismiss. There's so many other things before we go. I'm going to, I want to pray a prayer over you and then we have the giveaways. So please no one leave. Lots more going on tonight before we dismiss. Pray, praise the Lord. Bow your heads with me. Praise the Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for all that you've already done in this ser these services last night and today. Lord, I thank you that you're moving us up as women and men to be glorious, to understand the glory, to live in the glory and walk in it and experience the goodness that you have for each of us. Lord, I thank you that because of your presence, we are transformed and we are propelled to a higher place in you this morning. Lord, I praise you, Lord. I give you glory and honor. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence in this house. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet and grab hands of those next to you? We're going to pray a prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the word tells us that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. I think if once we taste of that presence, once we experience it, we always want more and more of it. Amen. So as you're holding hands with those next to you and centering in on God and reaching out to him, know that he is here in our midst. And he is pouring out of his good spirit upon you to strengthen you and empower you and bless you and help you. So I just want to pray a blessing on you right now. And I uh, want to leave this service with this powerful blessing that God has instructed me to place upon your life. In the name of Jesus, I bless you in the name of God, Jesus. I bless you. I call you empowered to prosper. I call you the healed of the Lord. I called you blessed going in and blessed going out. I call you that you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are too blessed to be stressed. You are anointed to win and impossible to curse. You are the blessed of the Lord and God has called you with a purpose, on purpose, to go forth and be a shining example of Him. And I say now you are being empowered. You are being infused with supernatural anointing from heaven even right now. And you are being equipped and strengthened and reinforced with, with supernatural power to go out and fulfill the calling and the plan that God has strategically placed on your heart. Lord, I thank you that they're being equipped even now, Lord. Your blessing, Lord. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Un 
limited blessing, Lord, upon each life and each person that's here in this house. And Lord, I declare that the spirit of healing is in this place. Oh, right now, Lord, I call those things that be not as though they were. They are healed and whole from the top of their heads to the whole sole of their feet. Lord, we grab hold of your promise. We thank you, Lord, that by your stripes we are healed. We are healed and strong, and we are going to live long and strong in the earth. Lord, we thank you that it's your will that each one of us live long and prosper, that we walk in health and we prosper even as our soul prospers. And Lord, I thank you that we're going to fulfill that will that you're going to strengthen. You're even bringing strength now to our bodies and our minds. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, give the Lord a hand clap. Hi, I'm Kathy Duplantis. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay up to date with all things Jesse Duplantis Ministries. God bless. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.